For those of you interested in watching specific parts of this video, check the description for timestamp links. You can click on a specific time and fast forward to the part that you want to watch. For others, let's begin with the chapter. Chapter 15 Life on Earth If you see the name of this chapter, you can easily guess that we are going to read about the living organisms of the earth. When we say life on earth, it is not just limited to human beings, plants and animals. It also includes microorganisms that you and I cannot see with our naked eyes. Alright, to start with, our environment has three domains. Lithosphere, Hydrosphere and Atmosphere. Lithosphere refers to rocks and minerals, which is basically the land on which we stand. It comprises of the crust and upper mantle. Then Hydrosphere, it is the liquid water component of the earth. It includes the oceans, seas, lakes, ponds, rivers and streams. The hydrosphere covers about 70% of the surface of the earth and it is the home of many plants and animals. The third one is the atmosphere. You remember this picture, different layers of the atmosphere? It is a thin layer of gases that exists above our planet's surface. It acts like a shield which doesn't allow some life essential gases like oxygen to go out in space. Likewise, it also prevents the incoming harmful rays of the sun to reach the earth's surface. So in short, we refer these three domains as sea, air and land. Now there is a fourth domain and a very important domain that forms our environment. It is called biosphere. It consists of living organisms from human beings to animals to plants to bacteria to multicellular organisms. Basically, it includes all the living components of the earth. So overall, our environment has four domains. The fourth domain, that is the biosphere, it interacts uniquely with the other three domains. In fact, it not only just interacts, but it is also influenced by the rest of the three elements. For example, the temperature, rainfall, moisture and sunlight has a great influence on the living organisms of the earth. A good factual example of this is, as we go away from the equator towards the polar region, the temperature drops. We all know that, right? But even sunlight drops to a certain extent. Now due to that, Biodiversity also decreases as we go away from the equator towards the poles because plants need sunlight to grow. The process is called photosynthesis. That's why at the equator you will find a lot of vegetation. But in the polar region it is very few. Another factual example is that all kinds of bacteria need moisture to grow and reproduce. At the equator you will find a lot of moisture. And then as you go towards the poles, due to low temperature, moisture level decreases. Bacteria also need moisture in order to thrive. Bacteria do not live long on the hard, cold surfaces with no moisture because they also need nutrients for energy, water to stay hydrated and moisture to grow. However, there are some bacteria that can adapt to the cold environmental conditions of the polar region, but generally they are few in number. Hence the conclusion is that these four domains uniquely interact with each other. They adjust in such a way that it makes life on earth possible. Or in other words, the survival of any living being on earth depends upon the interaction of these four domains. And what are these domains? They are lithosphere, hydrosphere, atmosphere and biosphere. Let's go to the first topic of this chapter, ecology. When we look at the word ecology, what comes to your mind? So here it says, ecology is the study of the earth as a household of plants, human beings, animals and microorganisms. So basically what it means is that it is a branch of biology that deals with the relations of organisms to one another as well as to their physical surroundings. So when organisms interact with themselves and with the environment, you'll see a pattern and relationship. Now what are those patterns and relationship? Well, it involves a lot of scientific research and studies to understand this pattern and relationship. And this is what the ecologists do. They primarily study the relationships between living organisms and their environment. So moments back, we learned about the four domains of our environment. They are lithosphere, hydrosphere, atmosphere and biosphere. Since these are the four domains of our environment, but these are classified into abiotic and biotic components. Abiotic refers to the non-biological, non-living component of the environment, such as sunlight, temperature, wind, land, mountain, water, etc. Basically, excluding biosphere, the other three domains fall under the abiotic component of the environment. 
and biotic refers to the biological or living component of the environment such as plants human beings animals and microorganisms in other words the fourth domain that is the biosphere comes under the biotic component so abiotic is the non biological non living component part of the environment and biotic is the biological living component of the environment please remember this difference so far we have read about the four domains of the environment which are lithosphere atmosphere hydrosphere and biosphere and these four domains are broadly categorized under abiotic and biotic components the next thing that you need to understand is the diversity of life forms is maintained through a healthy interaction between the biotic and the abiotic components in a literal sense what i mean is let's say a plant which falls under the biotic component so in order to grow a plant you need sunlight water and soil if you look at these three requirements they fall under the abiotic component this is what we mean when we say that a healthy interaction between the biotic and the abiotic component is needed to maintain the diversity of life forms in other words all four domains of the environment need to interact with each other in such a way that it makes life possible on earth i hope so far it's clear now that we have seen how biotic and abiotic components interact the next part that you need to understand is whenever a particular group of organism starts interacting with the abiotic factors you'll notice that there is a clear energy flow between the two in order to explain this in a simple manner i want you to look at the world map we know that the world map in terms of latitude is divided into tropical subtropical temperate and polar region in other words the temperature drops as we go away from the equator towards the polar region again the reason behind that is the availability of sunlight the equator receives the most direct sunlight because sunlight arrives at a 90 degree angle to the earth due to which sun rays are concentrated on smaller surface areas causing warmer temperatures and climates at the equator as we go away from the equator towards the higher latitudes the incoming rays move further away from the equator and that leads to a decrease in the solar intensity anyhow when you look at the heat zones of the earth you'll see that the climate changes drastically with a shift in latitude and this has an immediate impact on flora and fauna so what i'm getting at is on earth we have places that have different amount or levels of temperature moisture soil and sunlight in other words the world has many different environments now different environments support different varieties of organisms organisms survive only an environment in which their needs can be met if you understand this part then it is easy for you to understand that when a particular group of an organism depends or interact with its surrounding environment that is the abiotic factors between the organism and the environment there is a direct contact and there is a clear transfer of energy between the two this kind of interdependency is called ecological system i'll give you another example in a different form so that you understand it better if you have to understand what an ecological system is then simply think of it this way if you have a child at home i'm not saying yours it could be anyone in your family as an adult you will realize that it is a child's surroundings and social environment that influences his or her development basically the child becomes what the environment he or she grows in so that's what we call as an ecological system the next term over here is habitat a habitat is a place where plants and animals live and grow it has everything that they need to survive just like you have a home or a place to live so do animals and plants now a habitat should not be confused with an ecosystem ecosystem means when all the living things in a given area interact with each other and also with the non living environment in other words a direct contact between biotic and abiotic components of the environment is called as an ecosystem however habitat is an environmental area where a particular species of animal plant or other types of organism live as well as grow in numbers if i have to give you an example if you look at bears today there are only 8 surviving species of bears in the world and they are distributed widely across the world all these 8 types of bear have a certain biogeographical area where they grow as well as breed so what i'm trying to say is that the habitat of one bear is different from the habitat of another they all cannot survive in one habitat 
If you notice, here the physical as well as the chemical factors of the general environment plays an important role. Because a brown bear has a totally different chemical composition within its body when compared to a polar bear. And that's how these two bears live in a totally opposite environment. The next term over here is ecological adaptation. Ecological system and ecosystem are the same. It is the direct interaction of the biotic and abiotic component of the environment, which forms an ecosystem. As I've said before, there are different types of ecosystem that exist based on environmental conditions like temperature, moisture, availability of sunlight and water. With time, various plants and animal species have got adapted to a certain kind of environment. For example, a polar bear has white fur that helps them to adapt to the cold temperature of the arctic environment. And they eat high fat content aquatic animals like fatty fish, walruses and beluga whales. Now if you look at sloth bear, they are found in the tropical jungles of the western Ghats. They are basically insectivorous bear species that climb on trees and eat honeycombs. They also eat beetles, grubs and other insects. What we saw is two species of bear that have got adapted to their respective environment through evolution. This is what we call as ecological adaptation. Let's go to the next topic, types of ecosystems. I'll quickly show you the flowchart of different types of ecosystem, that way it will be easy for you to understand. Now ecosystem is of two types, natural and man-made. Moments back we have learned that in an ecosystem there is a natural interaction between biotic and abiotic components of the environment. Biotic refers to the biological living aspect like plants, animals, insects and microorganisms. Whereas abiotic refers to the non-biological non-living aspects like rocks, soil, water and sunlight. Now ecosystems are divided based on different physical conditions. Under the natural ecosystem, we have two types, aquatic and terrestrial. Aquatic ecosystem can be classed as marine and freshwater ecosystems. A marine ecosystem includes the oceans, coastal estuaries and coral reefs. A freshwater ecosystem includes lakes, ponds, streams, marshes and bogs. A terrestrial ecosystem can be further classified into biomes. Now what is a biome? A biome is a large terrestrial ecosystem which is characterized by a particular type of natural vegetation and animal life. If you look at this world map, you can see different biomes. As we go away from the equator towards the polar region, the temperature drops. This is what I mean when I say ecosystems are divided based on different physical conditions like rainfall, temperature, humidity and soil conditions. And you can also see that in this map, there are different biomes that exist depending on the latitude and it is a well-known fact that with the change in latitude, physical conditions of an environment also changes. Some of the major biomes of the world are forest, grassland, desert and tundra biomes. Man-made ecosystems, on the other hand, are created to copy the conditions of a natural ecosystem. Examples of man-made ecosystems are orchards, human aquarium, zoo, botanical gardens and park. These ecosystems are created and maintained by human society. That's why it is called as man-made ecosystem. So these are the different types of ecosystem. The reason we do such kind of classification is that living things respond as well as get influenced by the environment. Therefore, it is important to study and understand the links. Only then we can limit the damage, conserve or restore. So, to do good things for the environment, the biological science community studies the ecosystem and creates categories. Let's go to the next topic, structure and functions of ecosystems. Since we have been constantly reading that an ecosystem consists of biotic and abiotic factors, I'll quickly repeat again what are abiotic and biotic factors. Abiotic factors include rainfall, temperature, sunlight, atmospheric humidity, soil conditions, inorganic substances like carbon dioxide, water, nitrogen, calcium, phosphorus, potassium, etc. So basically these are non-biological and non-living aspects of the environment. On the other hand, Biotic factors include plants, animals, bacteria and other microorganisms. In other words, these are biological and living aspects of the environment. So we understand what is an ecosystem. Then you also understand what are the different types of ecosystem. 
it's time for you to understand the structure. And when you slowly understand the structure, you'll understand the function. So the structures look something like this. As we have seen that the environment is made up of abiotic and biotic components. And we know that all falls under these two components. So we will keep them separate and go step by step. This way we'll see how both the components interact. At first we have the sun, which is the ultimate source of energy for every living being on earth. After sun, we need soil because soil is a major source of nutrients needed by plants for growth. Then we have the primary producers, which are basically plants, algae and photosynthetic bacteria. They are also known as autotrophs. Producers form the base of an ecosystem. After that comes the consumers. The consumers are of four types. The first one is primary consumers. The primary consumers are herbivorous animals. They can be rabbit, deer, goat, cattle, etc. They feed on the primary producers for food and energy. That means the energy and nutrients are being transferred from primary producers to the primary consumers. The secondary consumers are the carnivorous animal, example cats, foxes, snakes, etc. They feed on the primary consumers, which are herbivorous animals, for food and energy. Now the energy and the nutrients from primary consumers are being transferred to the secondary consumers. Then comes the tertiary consumers. They are the large carnivorous animals which feed on the secondary consumers. Examples are wolves, crocodile, sharks, etc. And finally we have the quaternary consumers. These are omnivorous, meaning they eat variety of food of both plant and animal origin. Since they eat both plants and animals, they automatically come under the carnivorous category. Another important fact about quaternary consumers is that they are not eaten up by any other animals. That means they are apex predator. Now all these producers and consumers produce waste and also become waste, organic matter, when they die. This is where decomposers come into the picture and play a vital role in the ecosystem. Their role is to break down waste material and dead organisms and return vital nutrients such as carbon and nitrogen back into the environment. In other words, their role is to recycle the ecosystem. Now finally, if we have to point out the biotic and abiotic components of this entire ecosystem, what you need to do is separate the living and non-living aspects. The sun and the soil is the abiotic component and everything else belongs to the biotic component. So this is the entire structure and functions of an ecosystem. Now there are these terms food chain and food web. Let's get to know about them quickly with some illustration. The difference is not that much. It's very easy to understand so we will quickly look into it. Let's understand what is a food chain. It is a straight single pathway through which food energy travels in the ecosystem. Now what I mean by that is, let's say there's a tree. Tree and plants are basically known as autotrophs or producers. Then comes herbivorous animals who feed on plants and trees for energy and food. They are also called as primary consumers. Then comes carnivorous animals who feed on the herbivorous animals for food and energy. Like this if you notice, it forms a linear straight chain wherein one organism is eating another organism for food and energy. You see the food energy is traveling from plants and trees to herbivorous animals and then to the carnivorous animals. Or in other words, the high level organisms feed upon a single type of low level organisms for food and energy. This is what is known as food chain. I hope this part is clear. In an ecosystem, there are many types of species that exist and there are numerous amount of food chains. You'll see many species eating another species for food and energy and that's how you will come across many food chains in an ecosystem. Now sometimes species of a particular community interacts directly as well as indirectly with the species of another community. More often the indirect interaction between two species happens because of a third species. Overall species can influence one another in many different ways. With this kind of indirect interaction among species, food webs are formed. I'll give you an example of a tertiary ecosystem. Let's say there's a plant which has some flowers. 
then insect pollinators like bees, grasshoppers or flies feed on these leaves and flowers. Many species of birds, snakes and rats like to eat these flies and grasshoppers. So this forms one kind of a food chain. Now within the same ecosystem, let's introduce some more species like rabbit, squirrel and deer who feed on plants and trees. Some birds eat rabbit and squirrel. Then animals like fox also eats rabbit and squirrel. Here we see another food chain. Between these two food chains, you will find some interlinkage, wherein one species of animal is dependent on both the food chain. Now this interlinkage of food chain is called as a food web. Now this kind of interlinkage also happens between two different ecosystems. We'll take an example of aquatic ecosystem. Fish eat microworms, insects, plants and leaves. Then small fish gets eaten by bigger fish. Like this the chain continues. So this is another form of food chain of an aquatic ecosystem. If you notice, there's an interaction between these two food chain. As I said, fish eats insects, flies, leaves and flowers. These insects and flies are also part of the terrestrial ecosystem and they have their own food chain. But now, all of a sudden, there is an indirect interaction between the terrestrial food chain and the aquatic food chain. That means, there is an indirect interaction between species of different ecosystem. Now, this kind of interlinkage of two different food chains, regardless of which ecosystem they belong to, forms a food web. So basically, the role of a food web is to reveal the patterns of energy flow through different species and ecosystem. Now when you look at the structure of the ecosystem, as we have seen there are organisms that eat another organism and so on and so forth. This way the energy flows or transfers from one organism to another. So all of this is fine. Notice we read about the consumption of the energy part. However, there is also a loss of energy at each level through respiration, excretion or decomposition. After all what goes in has to come out. So there is an inefficiency in the overall flow of the energy between one organism to another. Let's move to the next topic, types of biomes. Now this particular topic requires a separate video. Although I have a playlist on world climate wherein you can learn about the Köppen classification of climate based on different climatic groups. In that you will also learn about how different parts of the world depending on the latitude have a different climate. I'm not saying you'll be able to understand this topic completely by seeing that playlist, but it will give you a fair enough idea about some of the biomes and its climatic characteristics. Meanwhile, I'll figure out how to make this topic world biomes in a short video and mostly with illustration and graphics. Until then, I recommend that you look at this table and just read through it. The moment I make that video, I'll put the link in the description. Alright, the next topic is biogeochemical cycles. At first, when you look at this term biogeochemical, it sounds very hi-fi and fancy. But if you break the word biogeochemical, it's nothing but the chemical exchange between living organism, that is where the bioterms come from, and the geographic element of the earth such as rocks, soil, air and water. So in simple terms, it is a cycle that shows us the movement of chemical elements between biotic and abiotic components of the environment. If I have to explain with an example, what are the essential chemicals that are present in the environment that determines life on Earth? Can you think of them? Water, H2O. It is important, right? Then we have carbon. Then we have nitrogen. Another one is phosphorus. There are many more, but these are some important chemicals. Now look at your body. You have DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid. It contains nitrogen molecules. Then your body needs amino acids, which are essential nutrients for the body to function. And amino acids contain carbon, oxygen, hydrogen, nitrogen, sulfur, etc. Your bones contain phosphorus. If you look at carbon, it is the basic building block to most cells in the body. It helps with cellular respiration, by which your body releases energy stored in glucose, and glucose compound is composed of carbon, hydrogen and oxygen. You see, these are essential chemicals for life. Now these same chemicals are also found in rocks, soil, air and water. But it doesn't mean that you start eating rocks and soil directly to have these chemicals in your body. Rather, these chemicals from the environment goes through a process and turns into food. 
We have talked about this when we read about the structure of the ecosystem, how one organism eats another for food and energy. That's how energy gets transferred from one form to another. While some of the energy gets lost in the process, but essentially these important chemicals get recycled. And if you see, most of these chemicals were present during the initial time when the earth was formed. That's why we call them as life essential chemicals. Anyhow, these chemicals go through a process and turn into food, which you are able to consume and that's how your body is able to function and have these chemicals replenished within you. After you die, all these chemicals are returned to the air, water and soil through decomposition. So this entire cyclic movement of chemicals between the abiotic and biotic components of our environment is referred to as biogeochemical cycle. Now that you have understood what a biogeochemical cycle is, you now have to understand that it is basically of two types. The reason I say it is of two types is because if you look at the important life forming vital chemical elements of our environment, I'm talking about carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, sulfur, calcium, potassium, etc. They can be easily segregated in the form of solid and gaseous form. For example, carbon as carbon dioxide, then hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen are basically gas and phosphorus, sulfur, calcium, potassium are found in sedimentary and igneous rocks. It is due to this classification, biogeochemical cycles are of two types, the gaseous and the sedimentary cycle. Now if you look at the gaseous cycle, obviously the elements are in gaseous form, but there are some combination of these elements such as hydrogen and oxygen that goes on to become water. That means the gaseous cycle has both the gaseous phase as well as the water phase. After all, evaporation converts water into water vapor, which is liquid to gaseous state. Therefore, the whole point is that the life forming chemical materials that go back in the environment from water to gaseous form is through the gaseous cycle. Likewise, if you look at the sedimentary cycle, the main components are soil and rocks, which are basically part of Earth's crust. So all the life forming chemical materials that go back in the environment from soil and rocks is through the sedimentary cycle. Now that we have understood gaseous and sedimentary cycle, let's quickly get to know about the individual cycles under these two broad category. The first one is water cycle. The lithosphere is the outer part of the earth consisting of the crust and upper mantle. And then there is the atmosphere which contain gases surrounding the earth. So in between the atmosphere and the lithosphere, water circulates through the water cycle. Now you must be thinking, what is the use of water cycle? Well, it is because of water cycle, all living organisms are able to maintain life. Because every form of life on earth depends on water in the form of solid, liquid or gas. Let me tell you the entire process of the water cycle in brief. In the first stage, the sun warms the water from the ocean, lakes, ice and soil. When the water is warm, it rises into the air and turns into water vapor. This is called evaporation, where the liquid water is converted into water vapor, which is in gaseous form. The next step is condensation. Water vapor rises up in the atmosphere. At high altitude, the temperature is very low. Because of that, the water vapor changes into very tiny particles of ice or water droplets. When these tiny particles of ice or water droplet come close together, they form clouds. The third step is precipitation. When ice and water droplet turns into clouds, now you have to understand that these clouds move all around the globe and they also grow in size. Actually, when the size is increasing, there will be a lot of water droplets inside. There will be a time when the cloud becomes too heavy to hold these water droplets. That's when it falls back on earth in the form of rain and snow. In the fourth and final step, the water from the rain and snow flows back into the ocean through rivers, lakes and streams. So this is the water cycle in brief. The next one is carbon cycle. When you hear the word carbon cycle, the important keyword over here is carbon. First, you have to understand this carbon is one of the basic elements of all living organisms. The reason I say that is because every living organism goes through the process of respiration. Respiration is basically the action of breathing. So we take oxygen, right? And then we release carbon dioxide. But it is not that simple. Our body cells use oxygen to get energy from the food we eat. 
and the byproduct of breaking food by oxygen is carbon dioxide. That's how energy is released. You will find a similar process in a mechanical device. In order to make a mechanical device work, there has to be a production of heat and light. And if you see a car engine and a rocket engine, both work by combustion. Combustion is a chemical process in which substances like petrol, diesel reacts with oxygen to produce heat. Again, even here carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide is a byproduct. So anyway, whether it is respiration or combustion, carbon dioxide is released into the atmosphere. Once the carbon dioxide is out there in the atmosphere, the next step is the entry of the carbon dioxide in the photosynthetic process. When we say the word photosynthetic, immediately think of plants, trees and algae. Because trees and plants consume carbon dioxide and release oxygen. So basically, the trees and plants use energy to reproduce. It is done by taking in carbon dioxide and releasing oxygen. Look at this amazing part of nature. On one hand, the human being and mechanical devices have a certain way of functioning. And then on the opposite side, there are trees, plants, algae, even they have their own way of doing things, which is completely opposite to us. You see, there is a fine balancing act going on. Of course, the problem comes when one of the side increases or decreases in population. Anyhow, the carbon dioxide enters into the photosynthetic process. Now in the next step, you have to realize that even plants and trees grow. Therefore, even they generate and release carbon dioxide. Now some of the carbon dioxides are released through its leaves and roots during the day. Then most of the carbon dioxide is contained within the plant tissue. Now if you can recollect the ecological pyramid, in that we have read that plants, trees and algae are called producers. And herbivorous animals feed on these producers for food and energy. When an animal consumes plants, the carbon compounds from the plant enters into the animal. And then in the final step, when plants and animals die, bacteria and fungi feed on the decays of dead plants and animals. This process is called decomposition. And again the byproduct is carbon, which returns to the atmosphere. This entire cycle is called as carbon cycle. The third one is oxygen cycle. We all know that oxygen is an important element of life on earth. So basically the oxygen cycle tell us how oxygen is being used and cycled by plants and animals. We all know that plants and algae perform photosynthesis, in which they consume carbon dioxide, sunlight and water to produce energy. Plants also have mouths. The green parts of plants are covered with tiny units called stomata. Light causes stomata to open and close. Typically stomata are open during the day and closed at night. This process produces oxygen as a byproduct. Animals and human beings breathe in the oxygen and then breathe out carbon dioxide. The plant can then use this carbon dioxide and the cycle is complete. That's why it is said that forest is important for human life because plants and trees consume carbon dioxide and generate oxygen. Anyhow, this is what is called as the oxygen cycle. The fourth one is nitrogen cycle. This whole nitrogen cycle is all about how nitrogen transforms into different forms in our environment. And if you see, nitrogen is a major constituent of the atmosphere, comprising about 79% of the atmospheric gases. Therefore, it is important to understand how the nitrogen cycle works. One thing which is crucial for the transformation of nitrogen is bacteria. So please remember this, bacteria is the key element in every step of the nitrogen cycle. The nitrogen cycle takes place like this. Overall, there are four steps. Before we begin with the steps, let's get to know a little about a nitrogen. Nitrogen is considered as an unreactive gas. Nitrogen gas is formed when two nitrogen atoms bond together. Together, they form a triple bond. In chemistry, you must have heard about single, double and triple covalent bonds. They represent strength between atoms. They are indicted in Lewis structures by drawing two or three lines connecting one atom to another. Double and triple covalent bonds are stronger than single covalent bonds because the amount of energy required to break the bond between two atoms which have triple covalent bonds is incredibly high. The more energy required, the stronger the bond is said to be. In a nutshell, triple bonds are difficult to break because they require a lot of energy to break. Now nitrogen molecules have a triple bond. 
and that makes it very unreactive because it requires a huge amount of energy to break the bonds. Now the big question is, where are you going to find that kind of energy? Once the strong triple bond is broken, nitrogen atoms are very reactive. So the whole meaning of the nitrogen cycle is to break the nitrogen molecules so that it can be utilized by plants and animals. Now the question is how to break the nitrogen molecule. Turns out there is a solution to that. There has to be a way by which nitrogen gas in the atmosphere must find its way into the soil. This is where bacteria in the soil comes into the picture. The roots of these plants are colonized by rhizobium bacteria. These bacteria have the ability to directly convert nitrogen into useful nitrogen compounds with the use of a special enzyme called nitrogenase. In simple words, rhizobium bacteria carry the nitrogen from the air to the soil and transform into another form called nitrates. This process is called nitrogen fixation. Just remember, nitrogen fixation takes unreactive nitrogen from the air and turns into a usable form. After nitrogen fixation, roots of plants absorb the nitrate. In the plant, they are in the form of protein and nucleic acids. If you can recollect the ecological pyramid, in that we have seen that plants are producers and herbivorous animals feed on plants for food and energy. That's how animals get the nitrogen they need by eating plants. When animals produce waste or die, bacteria consumes this dead organic matter. As a result, the nitrogen in this waste is in the form of ammonium. This process is called decomposition or ammonification. Now it is difficult for plants to use ammonium. So this waste ammonium is again broken down by bacteria through a process called nitrification. So basically ammonia is first converted into nitrite and then to nitrate. And now the plants can absorb nitrate. But the nitrogen cycle is all about sending nitrogen back into the atmosphere. This is where denitrification process comes into the picture. In this process, nitrates are converted into a variety of nitrogen gases. So what happens is, soil bacteria use nitrate for their respiration in the place of oxygen in the air. Because these bacteria are deep under the soil. As a result, gases like nitrogen oxide, nitrogen dioxide or nitrogen are formed. So this is how nitrogen goes back into the air. Among these gases, nitrous oxide, it is a greenhouse gas that can remain in the air for over 100 years. It is also one of the reasons behind depletion of the ozone layer. Anyhow, I hope you have understood what the nitrogen cycle is and please keep in mind that bacteria is the key element in every step of the nitrogen cycle. And the fifth one is other mineral cycle. Apart from carbon, nitrogen and oxygen, there are many other minerals that are essential for plant and animal life. Here we have the names of those minerals. Phosphorus, sulfur, calcium and potassium. These minerals are essential nutrients for plants and animals because it plays a critical role in cell development and it is a key component of molecules that store energy. However, they are secondary nutrients because plants require them in smaller quantities when compared to carbon, nitrogen and oxygen. If you look at these minerals, they usually occur in rocks. Over time, rain and wind cause rocks to release these minerals. Now these inorganic minerals are then distributed in soil and water. Plants take up these inorganic minerals from the soil. The plants are then consumed by animals. Once the plants and animals consume these minerals, these minerals, they are now incorporated into their organic molecules such as DNA. When plants or animals die, it decays. These minerals become organic and they return to the soil. So it is the bacteria that converts these inorganic minerals that come initially from rocks into organic minerals, which are then consumed by plants and animals. And when the plants and animals die, bacteria break down these organic minerals again into inorganic form. This process is known as mineralization and that's how these inorganic minerals end up in soil, river and ocean. So far we have learned about the water cycle, the carbon cycle, the oxygen cycle, the nitrogen cycle and other mineral cycles. So all these cycles collectively come under biogeochemical cycles and they have been broadly categorized under gaseous and sedimentary cycle. Now we will read about the last topic of this chapter, ecological balance. 
When you hear the word balance, it's talking about the left hand side and the right hand side that has to be on the equal level. Now the question is what's there on the left side and what's there on the right side? On the left side you can place living organisms such as human beings, plants and animals. And on the right side it's their environment. So basically ecological balance is a state where there is equality between organisms and their environment in terms of coexistence. Now this kind of balance happens only if both sides are stable. Let's take the relationship between a fox and a rabbit. Although fox actually eats a wide variety of food, for this example's sake, we will stick to fox and rabbit. In this case, a fox is a predator and a rabbit is a prey. When the rabbit population increases, there is more food available for the fox. Since there is more food available for the fox, its population increases. Since there is more fox, they eat even more rabbits and thereby causes the rabbit population to decrease. When the rabbit population drops, there is less food available for the fox. Now this causes the fox population to eventually drop. This cycle continues over and over with each species keeping the other species population in check. So in this way, a perfect ecological balance is achieved. But as there is a saying, life is not that simple as it seems. There are cooperation as well as competitions among species which are harmful. They usually compete for territory, water, food or mates. Any disturbance due to survival leads to change in the species distribution. Here is a good example. In grasslands where the herbivorous animals like deer, zebras, buffaloes are found in plenty. On the other hand, the carnivorous animals like tigers, lions are not usually in large in numbers. They hunt and feed on the herbivores, thereby controlling their distribution as well as density. Density refers to the number of species living in a particular area and distribution refers to how these species are arranged in a particular area. Now this kind of change is seen in plants as well. Any disturbance in the forest such as deforestation, change in weather or temperature brings a change in the species distribution of plants. It can wipe out many species of plants or certain new species of plants can overtake and change the existing forest structure. This is called succession, wherein the secondary forest species such as grasses, bamboos and pines overtake the native species, changing the original forest structure. Now this part talks about the factors that disturb the ecological balance. Some factors are the introduction of new species natural hazards or human causes. Among these three factors, human interference is considered to be the prime reason which is responsible for disturbing the ecological balance. Some of the human interference include industrial and atmospheric pollution, faulty mining practices, deforestation, land degradation and soil erosion due to agricultural activities, faulty utilization of water resources and many more such problems. I have a video on environmental pollution, you can watch that for a more in-depth explanation about each category. I'll put the link of that video in the description. Once there is an ecological imbalance, the consequences can be seen in the form of many natural calamities like floods, landslides, diseases, climate change, etc. Therefore it is important to study and have proper knowledge about the environment and ecology. When we say we need to conserve nature or environment, why? Why do we need to do that? Because that's how the diversity of life can be maintained, right? And that happens with proper knowledge and understanding of various factors because we know there is a very close relationship between the environment and the living organisms. With this, we have come to an end of this chapter. The question and answer can be found on the website. The link is there in the description. Also check the description for timestamp links. You can click on a specific time and fast forward to the part that you want to watch. I hope you have found this video informative. Let me know your thoughts in the comment section. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one.